I'm sure we look at our lives and realize that we have one life, we are living it, we are young and then we get older and we get old and we want it to, to mean something. We want to have an impact in our life with the people around us that we're close to and we would like to live a glorious life that would be profitable, will be something that will show that that person was here and in that generation, as David did, he served his generation well. I'm sure we would like to have that type of life, that we mean something to somebody and that we have not wasted our life while we lived here upon this earth. And therefore, we become to realize, well, how do I focus my attention on living a, a glorious life like that? I wasn't there, you weren't either. In fact, nobody except God was there when on the first day of creation he said, let there be light. But if you were there, wouldn't that have been a marvelous thing to tell people about? That the darkness of the universe was shining, not by the sun, that wasn't created until later. Not any stars, but the glorious light of God himself. Oh, what could be said about that? Mortal man to be speaking about things that glorious? That would be wonderful to be able to tell, but we weren't there. But you and I live in his creation today. And we marvel at nature. And we know that Paul tells us in Romans 1 and verse 20, that when we look at the things that are made, we see his everlasting power and divinity, his wisdom and power that brings it to and being, and we go to the Grand Canyon, and we go to the forest, and we go to places, and we just eat up and, and kind of dwell in the nature and realize how glorious is God. And God, through Paul, says we're without excuse if we don't have those moments that we realize there's something greater than what has been made that stands behind it, and it's, it's deep God. And I want to suggest to you that to live the glorious life the most successful life you can live is to be right with the creator who created you. And what is interesting that when we become a Christian, there's a uniting effect. We don't have to wonder about glory because the Christian's unifying glory is centered in God, not ourselves. And at the first part of this lesson, we're going to look at areas where it ties in. When we want to say this is glorious and my life is going to be centered upon this glorious thing, it's going to be on the glorious God. And we realize that one of the things that I realize in my life and as I see my relationship with my creator, I, send, I center the glory of God with dealing with my sin. Paul says in Romans 3, 23, that we have all fallen short. Every one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That's what sin is. And what I missed the mark, okay. That's what you did. But what was that mark set at? I was created to glorify God. And when I sin, I fall short of that glory. So who do I look at for for being my Savior? Well, God's Son. Jesus, who created, brought things into existence. He's the Word that spoke it into existence. He's eternal. But He came to this earth. He took on flesh and blood. And He saved men from their sins. Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners in 1 Timothy 1 and verses 15 through 17. That's a faithful say that Jesus Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. And in Paul, he showed his long suffering with the chiefest of sinners that all those that would come after Paul would have the confidence of their salvation. If he saved me, he can save you, is Paul's argument. And then he summed it up to be to God eternal, to God be honor. To God be glory forever and ever. Kind of like I've been saved from my sin now. I fell short of the glory of God. And now do I turn to something else to be glorious? Uh, to, to, be glor to, to realize that's glorious? No, my Savior who saved me from sins, he deserves the glory. I'm glorifying God. 
my sin, my Savior? What about my confession? That I not, I'm not confessing my sins, I'm confessing who Jesus is as my Lord. Paul says Philippians 2 and verse 11, that indeed it, every knee should bow and confess Jesus as Lord. And every tongue should confess. Every tongue should confess, as our knee is bowed, every tongue should confess that Jesus is, is our Lord to the glory of God. I'm still unified in one thing that is glorious. I failed in my sin. I got my Savior Jesus Christ, and to Him be glory forever and ever, for God sending Him and for Jesus dying. And now I have a Savior. Now I have a Lord. I have a Master. I have one that I'm going to submit to. And who is that Lord? He's the same one as my Savior. It's the same one that saved me from my big problem of sin that took me down from the glory of God that I needed to be with my Creator. So I got my Savior. I got my Lord. I'm speaking with God that He's the Son of God. And He's going to be leading my life. And it's all about, now He's the center of my hope. What do you hope for? I want to hope for something glorious. What about heaven? And Paul says in Colossians 1 that indeed this mystery, the gospel has been revealed. And it's not only revealed to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And this is the goal, that Christ is in you, the hope of glory. You probably hope for glorious things. You probably hope for things that are, are, are honorable, that are that are demonstrated and said, this is a goal to have. What about your hope centered upon heaven? And it's unifying because I don't have to turn for away from Christ. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And he brought me back from what I failed to do, my sin, that I fell short of God's glory. It's all about God's glory. That's the unifying glory. It's not about me. It's about God. And I can have a relationship with him as he's my savior. He's my Lord. I'm not ashamed to confess that with my mouth. And my future, he's my hope. I don't have to go all over the map and say, well, I'll be glorious in this area. And I'll be glorious in this area. And I'll have accolades over here and all that. No, no, it's all centered. The Christian's unifying glory. That's what we're going to focus in upon this morning. And so we continue with this saving gospel message and we realize that it is a unifying gospel. Look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, in verses one through six. Our calling, as we've been called by the gospel, and Paul is, is, is writing to Christians, but notice this idea that, that we can be unified in our creator, in our savior, in, our, in the gospel that he's, he's given us. First one, I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, say the Lord's my master, and I just happen to be in prison because I'm preaching the gospel. That wasn't too glorious, Paul. Yeah, Paul says it is. Paul would say, that's what I'm here to do because I want to glorify God for people hearing the saving message. But he says, you Walk worthily of the calling wherewith you were called. You rise up and meet the standard of the gospel, you brethren in Ephesus, and are gathered here at Parkview, with all lowliness and meekness. It's not about me. With long suffering, I'm not going to give up on you. Forbearing one another in love, giving diligence to keep the unity of of the Spirit, what the Spirit has revealed, that we could have unity, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're not to create unity. We're to keep it. It's here. It's the gospel. And you know why we can have unity? Because there's only one body, one church. There's one Spirit. Even now as you're called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, there's only one faith. One baptism, one God and Father of all. There's not 330 million gods. There's one God. 
He's the Father of all, who's over all, He's through all, and in all. We can get united when He's everything. And that's the gospel. That's the calling where we're called. It creates in us how we're going to relate to others and unity and peace. We don't have many faiths to argue about. We don't have many gospels. We, we, we don't have a lot of hopes to divert us to glorious future. One hope of our calling. And that's why the glory of God as seen in the saving gospel is our unifying glory. That's what we glory in. That saving message. It has a unifying love. We're forbearing one another in love. What about this love? How come it can unify the whole person? Pharisees want to know which is the greatest commandment. God, uh, Jesus, as, he tested, as they tested Jesus. There were ten commandments. Which one are you going to pick as being the greatest? Jesus didn't fall into that trap, but he told us what the, all the commandments of God, all the teachings, the prophets, what they hung upon, and he had two of them. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Well, actually, you, you don't divide yourself. I got this God, I got this God, I got this glory. I got No, it's all about God's glory. And I love him with all of my being. I'm not divided. I got unifying love because I have all of my love upon God. And the second commandment is likened unto it. I will love my neighbor as myself. My relationship with God and my relationship with one another. It's all centered in glorifying God who gave me that direction. I love God with all of my being and therefore I will love others. I will care about others. And we saw that in Ephesians 4. Forbearing one another in love. I'm caring about other people. But we're not going to create a standard for unity. We're going to keep the unity that's been delivered in the gospel. And it's there for us. We can unify in love because our total love is on God. And it has room to include our fellow man as well. And what do we We love them like we would like to be treated. Unifying gospel, unifying love, unifying joy. What gives you joy? What do you delight in? Is it going to be separate from the Lord? No. We're going to rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice, Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice what? Because my circumstances are good? No. Paul's in prison. And he says rejoice in the Lord. Circumstances do not affect our joy when we have this unifying glory in our heart. And it's God's glory. Paul was able to preach the gospel in prison and save people they might not have had contact with. You're having contact with people every day. And we can unify. I want God to be glorified. And I want people to, to, to realize how glorious God is in saving us from our sins. And we can be united, united in the gospel and in love. And our joy, our delight is in the Lord, not in circumstances. Chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul is dealing with having to bring forth errors of doctrine. He said, rejoice to the Lord. It's not irksome for me to remind you of something that you need to know. There's a people acting like they're, they're the God's people. They're not. And he's rejoicing. He's rejoicing in prison. He's rejoicing in the Lord in times of anxiety. Back to Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Let your forbearance be made known unto all men. That's the word gentleness. When we're anxious, we're not gentle. And yet we can be because we're not glorying how well I handle my circumstances. We're glorying in the Lord. And I can rejoice in Him. I can talk to Him in prayer. He is close by and He will guard my heart and my thoughts in Christ Jesus. And what do we do? Thank you for that peace God that I have with you through Jesus Christ. Unifying gospel, unifying love, unifying joy, where we, we love and we rejoice, but it's all centered in what we consider to be glorious. And it's one thing, God. And when we see that, it helps us in our life. Number one, it helps us keep our 
hearts pure as Christians. I'm saying glorifying God, that's going to be what your goal is and your purpose in life. I'm going to live a life that's glorifying God, not me, but I will be glorified because I glorify him. I, that's what I want. I want to glorify God. Now, here is a statement made by a well-known televangelist, scholar, brilliant man. He's died. He died a couple of years ago. And in a paper which, him, which he and a lot of other well-known scholars, they wrote, why am I still a Christian? Why am I a Christian? Why am I still a Christian? And this man wrote part of the paper, and this is what he said. I came to him because I did not know which way to turn. You may be on this journey. And he would be right there to tell you what he has found in Christ. I have remained with him because there's no other way I wish to turn. I came to him longing for something I did not have. But I'm remaining with him because I have something I will not trade. I came to him as a stranger. Didn't know Jesus, didn't know God real well. I came to him as a stranger. I remain with him in the most intimate of friendships. You draw closer to the Lord as you continue to glorify him and realize what he's done for you in salvation and so forth. No longer a stranger, but the closest of friends. I came to him unsure about the future. Don't know where it's heading. I remain with him, certain about my destiny. Sounds good, doesn't it? It might be something that, that's, that's a wise, wise thing here. And there's so much good. You come, I don't know which way to turn. I, I, I don't know you're there all of a sudden. I'm in a place where I don't wish to turn anywhere else. You, you satisfy me to the ultimate. I don't have anything to, to trade, but I didn't have anything to have. I, I didn't have eternal life. I didn't have salvation from my sin. And I wouldn't trade that for the world to have that relationship with God. I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't raised with parents that knew the Bible. I've been out here on my own. And I came as a stranger, but I feel the companionship of deity through the word. I wasn't sure of the future. I know I am certain about my destiny. Remember hope in Christ, the hope of heaven. That's what's in us, all to the glory of God. And this is where we have to be careful. This sounds good. But sadly, this particular gentleman, after he died, all the things of his corruption came out into the world. He had a lot of money for humanitarian purposes. He went to college campuses debating atheists, giving people hope. And yet, he had dirty pictures he looked at. He abused people, girls who gave him massages. He spent his money upon illicit sexual endeavors. He became so corrupted that one of the ladies said that we prayed together after we had sex. And he says that God had just blessed him. You did a great thing because God's blessed him because he's been his such a great servant of the Lord. And if you tell what has just happened, you will destroy people's faith when my reputation is ruined. Manipulation on people who may just be wanting to find their way. And put that upon the woman you just had sex with. Power. And he was doing this 
up to a couple of weeks before his death. And I put this in red. I remain with him because there's no other way I wish to turn. That's not true in his life. He turned to pornography. He turned to sexual abuse. I remain with him because I have, I have something I, I will not trade. Oh, he traded it in. The lust of the flesh, he traded it in. I remain with him in the most intimate of friendships. Here's holy God. I don't have anything to do with you. I will show that on the end. And this real looks good. I came as a stranger. Now a most intimate relationship. Up to the time of your death, you were doing these things. Whether it's his doctrine or his ego. I'm certain about my destiny. Once saved, always saved. You can't be lost. Or was it just his ego, which what comes out is this true person? Wonder if he said, you know, I'm going to do the debating. I can, I can, I'm, I'm brilliant in the area of trying to help people understand teachings of God and, and, and have these discussions and these debates to bring souls to Christ. But you know what? It's not about me. It's about the glory of God. God is holy. It is about God receiving the glory, not me. He went astray, didn't he? He failed. And his ministry has been ruined. They're trying to rebuild it. But if you glorify God, it keeps your heart as a Christian pure. It's not about me. It's not what I can have. It's what I can do and how I can manipulate. It's all about me. No. If he had the grounding as what we're trying, what unifies us is the grounding that God be glorified. If God's holy, I'm going to be holy. I'll have to fight the temptations. I'll fight it. Because my life, my success in my life is that I'm going to be a servant of God Almighty. And because of his character, I'm going to be holy because God is holy. And you know what? We need to be able to unite our heart. Psalm 86, turn right there with me. In Psalm 86, verses 11 and 12, we read where the psalmist of the psalm of glorifying God. And it's a, it's a prayer of David. He's praying to God. Listen to what he says in verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Jehovah. I'm going to walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear my name because I've got myself, my selfishness. I've got my ego. I'm go here one day, another day I'm saying I came to him because I had no place to turn and God's, God's everything to me. And another man said, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's important. Satisfy my lust. Unite my heart to reverence thy name, to reverence thy authority. And that's not the end of it. Verse 12, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with my whole heart because my heart is united to glorify you. And I will praise thee, O Lord, with all of my heart. I will glorify thy name forever and ever. You can't glorify God's name when you're looking at pornography and abusing women sexually. During the week while on Saturdays or Sundays you're preaching the glorious gospel of Christ. Your heart's not united. That's at least an understatement, isn't it? I got to unite it. And you know what you can unite it on? You can unite it that my life is going to be centered upon glorifying God. Glorifying God. We live in a world on social media that it's all about me. It's all the time. Look what I've done. Look at me feed my cat. Look at me feed my bunny. I've watched that a few times this week. Look what I'm doing. It's about me. And there's a generation that was about me. Watch me kill 10 people in New York. I'll put it on the internet where you can see it. And we're trying to reach people. There's a generation 
that it's, it's all about them. And they want to share everything they do because they think you ought to be interested in them. So you can listen to TED Talks and you can listen to podcasts and you can, you can get all sorts of information on the internet now. I mean, you can set up your own thing and then you can be giving out their information. Here's one. And to turn with me to Matthew, the sixth chapter. And this is how you reach people and convince people of maybe how the life that they ought to live. And what you do in this generation, you make people feel incredible about themselves. But it needs to be secretly incredible. So here's a step that said, well, this is, this is how we'll please God. And Jesus talked about this, didn't he? In Matthew 6, verse 2 and 3. When therefore thou doest alms, sound not a trumpet. Look at me. I'm giving. Look what I'm giving. And all the rich people around you say, well, look how generous that person is. They say, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Look at me, what I'm doing. So uh, I will be glorified. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. It's not about you. But you can still be secretly incredible. Because what you're doing, you're helping somebody. That's, that's placing things on a sand foundation. It's going to crumble. Because it's still about you, isn't it? So we've got to reach these people. And so you need to understand that, that you do alms. You don't let left hand know what your right hand is. It's not about you. He says that alms may be, be in secret. And thy father who seeth in secret shall recompense thee. You give those things and nobody knows it. And you're not even thinking about yourself. And so they take this passage from Jesus, and they're still talking about something that I will be if I do this. If I follow Jesus's, and this is the illustration they give. You don't wear on your jacket, I am awesome. You wear a t-shirt inside that says, I'm going to be awesome. I will be awesome. And we're talking about how to get you spiritually grounded in your faith. How to be involved in how to... But, but don't you think about yourself. Really? I'm awesome. No, we don't do that. We do things in secret. We get the job done. We help people, but we just want to work. We were awesome. We were awesome when we did that. Really? Remember the reading we had this morning? When the disciples say, increase my faith, O Lord. He said, if you, had a, if you had a faith as of a small seed of a mustard seed, these apostles could do miracles, you know. If you had that kind of faith, you could tell that sycamore tree to be rooted up and you cast it in the sea. It's not a problem of your faith needs to be bigger. You need to do what you're commanded to do. And he says that when you've done that, consider yourself an unprofitable servant, not awesome because you did what you're commanded to do. Who gets the glory? A lot of times in our social media, be secretly incredible. That sounds good, doesn't it? Like I was lost and I'm found. I didn't know which way to turn now, I wouldn't give it up in any way. It sounds good. But you put your life on something that's more substantial than that. And that becomes important. We'll come back to it in a moment. I'm suggesting to you that I can be something inside and outside is the same thing. I don't have to be secretly incredible because what's inside me is always God be glorified. If God is pleased, that's all I need. I've done what he told me to do. I've done it in the way... To be done. And I'm not ashamed outwardly of God being glorified. See, you don't wear the jacket. I'm awesome. Well, I want to do good works. Matthew 5:16, I'm the light of the world, and you shine that they may see your good works 
and glorify whom? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. I want God to be glorified. I'll put that on my jacket. But so that's my outside world. That's my outward passion. The reason I'm doing things is not about me, is that people will see Christ working in my life and I can talk to them about Jesus and talk to them about God. But you know, that's what I am inside too. That's my t-shirt. God be glorified. That's the, what drives me. Whether it's outside or inside, I don't have to change. I am not awesome. I'm going to be awesome though. I'm, I'm doing awesome things. I'm secretly incredible. Just look at me. Luke, the 14th chapter, if you'll turn there, here's something that we guess would be secretly incredible. Nobody knows this but the people you're helping. And Jesus says, you don't invite those who can turn around and invite you back to a supper. But what you ought to do in verses 12 and 14, call not thy friends, thy brethren, thy kinsmen, lest happily are the rich neighbors, lest happily they'll be able to recompense you and have you over. But... What do you do in verse 13? But when thou makest a feast, bid the poor. They can't, they can't afford to make one for you. The maimed, the lame, the blind. And thou shalt be blessed, because they have not wherewith to recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed in the resurrection of the just. So here's the motivating factor for people on the internet today and, and for spiritually minded people. That you don't put money in the plate and do so humbly, try to help some big organizations. You can help people where you find them. Don't tell the idea, I, I, I'm awesome because I give to a great organization. But the point is, get the job done where you are. And that's a good thought. That's what we're doing. But what was the driving force? I met their need. I mean, secretly incredible. Didn't wait for bureaucracy to get on board. I took care of that. Not a one of these people could be able to repay me. And maybe no, not a one of my rich people know about this, but they do. And those people know me, and those people know I helped them. I was awesome. When are you going to be recompensed by God? When you sit around and say, I got the job done. I am secretly incredible. Or will it be God will recompense in the day of the judgment? In the day of the resurrection of the just? That's when you'll be rewarded. And you know what? If what drives your passion is God be glorified, for God to recompense me on the day when he comes back again and to reward the just, that's fine. That's glorious. I don't care if any of these people thank me that I just helped. And my reward was not, I will be awesome. And now God knows and I'm incredibly, I'm incredible, I'm secretly incredible. I think that falls short of what a Christian's passion should be. And what happens whether I wear it on my jacket or my t-shirt, it's united my whole being. God be glorified, and when he glorifies me, that's a glorious life. Regardless of what happens next. Back to Matthew 6. That compense, God will recompense you. Isn't that what Matthew 6 is talking about? God sees in secret and he will deal with that. He sees in secret and he will recompense, re recompense you. He will reward you. But what are you doing? I'm I just did something awesome. I'm in secretly incredible. At least that has a place for one to fall into an area where it's not good, it's about him and not about God. But God be glorified, unites you in every phase of your life. And we, we see that 
in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 20 and 21. If your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You feed them. If he's thirsty, give him to drink. You'll heap coals of fire upon their head. Because why? They've done you evil. And you cannot change that. But where God is glorified inside and out is that what do you do on the outside? I will feed them. I will give them to drink. They need water. I will give them to, something to drink. Those are my enemies. Now, what happens after that? Well, I was awesome. I was secretly incredible. No one knew I did that. And you know what? Those people, when I did something, I did something one-on-one. -on -one. I took care of a problem there, and they became one of my closest friends because I was awesome. I was, I didn't do it to be showy. I didn't have to fanfare. I was secretly incredible. Did that passage say that they became your friends? You turned your enemies into friends? Or did you overcome evil with good? That's the issue. I took evil done to me. And I turned it into good. So God could be glorified. So God could be glorified. Not that I would be secretly incredible. You can listen to your TED Talks. You can listen on the internet and you think, oh, that's just out of this world. I want to be tomorrow. I'm going to get up and I'm going to get things done. Yeah, I'll, I'll meet the needs. I'll help people. But what is it going to be centered at? God's glorified? If that's what drove you, you didn't talk about it on your podcast and TED Talks. And that's what's missing. You and me glorifying God. We're sharing the gospel to people. We're doing things for people. And whether we get the accolades or not, and God's accolades may not come till way later. The resurrection of the just. But I know what? God is glorified because we're overcoming evil with good. God will be glorified. That's how God works in our lives. All that we do, with some of the two passages, if you want to sum up all that we do? All that we do, we do all in the name of the Lord. It's all about Him. Colossians 3 and verse 17. It is in a context of joyous worship. We're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're singing with grace in our hearts. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ is full of thanksgiving as we submit ourselves to the authority, to the authority of God and of the Lord. And all that we do in word or deed, we're united. Our hearts united. It's all to your glory, God. Thank you for Jesus. Let's worship. And then in a context of caring about souls, caring about the conscience of others instead of ourselves. Oh, I could eat those meats without any offense to me, but maybe the person that you have, they believe is still a sacrifice to a God. Whatever you, you do, we're a deed to all in the name of the Lord. Whether you eat or drink, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God. What I want you, young, old, those on the are, are, are listen are watching are listening to their podcast. And you have all sorts of teachers and gurus and people that can excite you with things. There's nothing more exciting to get in tune with your Creator. And what is uniting the well, idea of forgiveness of my sins, the route I need to go, what what who's going to control my life? It's God. It's the Lord. When I focus upon that, there is one unifying glory that I want to accomplish in my life. And I want to build that in your heart. Glorify God in all that you do. He gets the credit. He gets the glory. And you don't have to take off your jacket and put on your t-shirt and show you how incredible you are. You just live it. It's inside all the deeds that you do, it's not divided. It's all about the Lord. When you have that mindset, 
You can accomplish great things. You'll get the job done. There's no wrong with, well, I'm going to wait till the church takes care of that. You might take care of needs that nobody else knows about. And nobody may not know about it. But I don't walk around with my t-shirt that says, I, I am being awesome today. God is being glorified today. And when the creator of the universe, the creator of our flesh and blood, the creator of our souls, when he is glorified, you can't live a more glorious life than that. And I offer it to you that indeed we'll have that in our lives. This morning, if you're not a child of God, maybe on a journey trying to find the Lord, we're here to assist you. But as we said, there's one faith. There's one standard that gives you the 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 words to, to believe in, and that's Jesus Christ. You won't have millions of gods to have to divide your devotion to. And you'll be able to center yourself, get myself in check. Who do I want to please in this life? Please your creator, who has to be your savior, who happens to be your hope, who happens to be the power in your life that you can overcome circumstances. Unite my heart to fear thy name, O God, and I will glorify thy name forever and ever. That's a successful life, and it starts with you becoming a Christian. If we can help you come to that place where you can confess Jesus to be the Son of God, and we can baptize you into Christ based upon your knowledge, that's your understanding, then let us do so. We'll take that journey with you. But if you're there, don't put it off. Obey the gospel as we stand and as we sing.